everybody welcome to bhavin anatomy so today we are going to start with muscle tissue the collection of contractile cells together is called muscle tissue by the end of today's lecture we understand definition functions of muscle tissue types of muscle tissue and we'll study skeletal muscles in detail in skeletal muscle we'll study parts structure classification of skeletal muscle blood and nerve supply of the muscles and in the end we'll study clinical anatomy Muscle is defined as a contractile tissue which brings about the movement of the organ and body as a whole. So that's why it is also called motors of the body. Something that gives movement to the body. The muscle word is derived from the Latin word mus or musculus that means little mouse. So it is when muscle is contracting the appearance and disappearance of mouse like feature gives the name muscles. It is this mouse and not this mouse. We have around 250 muscles in our body. The word myo and sarco is associated with the muscle. 40% of our body weight is because of the muscle tissue. Developmentally, all the muscles of the body develop from the mesoderm. There are few exceptions. The first is erectoris pylorum muscle, the muscle which is attached to the hair follicle. Then myoepithelial cells of glands, both of them develop from ectoderm. And the muscles of iris develop from the neuroectoderm. Rest all the muscles in the body develop from mesoderm functions of the muscle tissue are it gives movements to the body it guards and en entrance and exits of the body maintenance of posture it also helps in the joint stabilization supports the soft tissues heat generation so out of total energy utilized during contraction of muscle only 20% is for the work and 80% of that energy is for the heat production in the body so contraction of muscle maintains a normal body temperature so that is why whenever we feel cold there is shivering of the body that is the contraction of the muscles to produce heat in the body and there are certain basic properties of all the muscle tissues first is excitability whenever there is no impulse the muscle cell excites and it contracts so contraction can result into 50% of shortening of the muscle cell then extensibility is a stretching and muscle cell can be stretched up to 20% and coming back to its normal position after relaxation is called elasticity so this is the basic functional feature of all the muscle tissues now let us see what are the types of muscle tissues so this here is the classification of muscle tissue first is skeletal muscle tissue which is attached on the skeleton smooth muscle tissue is present on the walls of viscera's and cardiac muscle tissue in the walls of the heart So here is a comparison chart of all three types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle is located on the skeleton of the body. It is called voluntary because contraction of this group of muscle is in our own control. Whereas smooth muscle and cardiac muscles are involuntary. They are called striated because the appearance of striations in the microscopic view. Smooth muscles are non-striated and cardiac muscles are faintly striated. Skeletal muscles are also called somatic muscles because they develop from the somites. and these are called visceral muscles another name of cardiac muscle is myocardium the function is skeletal muscle give movement to the body parts visceral muscle gives movement to the visceras and myocardium gives pumping of the blood from the heart rhythmicity is present in smooth and cardiac muscle and the nerve supplying the smooth and cardiac muscle is called autonomic nerves because of its automatic control whereas the nerve supply of skeletal muscle is somatic nerves here you can see the histological picture of three types Skeletal muscle the fibers are long and cylindrical which is multinucleated because it is formed by fusion of many cells and you can see the striations visible striations in the skeletal muscle in cardiac muscle the striations are little bit faint but there is presence of uh, intercalated disc in the cardiac muscle cells and there is a branching pattern found in the cardiac muscles where smooth muscle is fusiform non striated and single nucleated cells Now we are going to study skeletal muscle in detail today. Basic features there are certain basic features of skeletal muscles. First is skeletal muscle is there to perform a movement and that movement happens at the joints of the body. Now to perform a movement at the joint the first thing is that the muscle has to cross the joint. If the muscle crosses a joint then only it can perform a movement on that joint. Now there are few exceptions to that. 
They are facial muscles. They don't cross a joint because they attach on the skin of the face and produces the expressions of the face. Certain articular muscles and certain sphincteric muscles, they are uh, not crossing any joint but still they perform some movement at some parts of the body. Now, muscle has got two ends. The one end is called origin and another end is called insertion. Now, whenever muscle contracts, it produces a movement at the joint and one bone which is forming the joint moves more compared to the other bone. So, one bone is fixed, the other bone moves. So, the part of muscle which is attached on the fixed bone or less mobile bone is called origin and part of muscle that is attached on the more mobile part is called insertion. Usually, the origin is proximal and insertion is distal. However, this is not fixed. Origin and insertion can be reversed in, in different movements of the body. Then it has got two other parts. One is called belly, another is called tendon. Here you can see this is one muscle of the body called gastrocnemius. And it is having upper part. Here you can see this part is called belly and the white tough fibrous structure is called tendon. Belly is contractile and it cannot withstand any pressure or friction. But tendon is a coat like tough structure, fibrous structure which can uh, withstand the friction also. And they say that the tendons are so tough if, it, if there is sudden contraction of muscle, the bone might break but the tendon will not get torn. And here is the, here you see this tendon is called tendocalcinum which is the strongest tendon of the body. Sometimes some tendons are flattened and those flattened tendons are called aponeurosis. Here you can see in this picture, this is the flattened tendon and flat tendon is aponeurosis. Usually whenever a tendon is, whenever a tendon is crossing a joint, so during movement, there is always some amount of friction and to prevent those friction at the site uh, when the tendon comes in contact with the bone, there is presence of a synovial bursa and a synovial sheath. Synovial fluid is a lubricating fluid in the body and here you see that when this tendon is crossing a joint, it can come under friction from this bone. So to prevent that, there is a small bag like synovial fluid, which is called synovial bursa. The word bursa is derived from the same word where the English word purse has derived. Purse or bursa means pouch. So this is a small synovial pouch. And whenever a tendon is crossing a joint, sometimes there is a elongated tubular synovial uh, tube is there and that is called synovial sheaths. So this synovial bursa and synovial sheaths are there in the body to prevent the friction at the tendon. So after studying the basic feature of skeletal muscle that is origin, insertion, belly and tendon, let us move on to classification of skeletal muscles. First we did was classification of muscle tissue. Now we are going to study classification of skeletal muscles. Now skeletal muscles are classified according to color, according to the direction of muscle fibers, force of action and group of action. We will see all of them one by one. First is according to the color. According to the color, the skeletal muscles are divided into red types, white type of fibers and third is intermediate type of fiber. Now red fibers are also type 1 fibers. These fibers are slow uh, to contract but the contraction lasts for a longer period of time. They don't fatigue very easily and example is all the postural and anti-gravity muscles. You can stand up for a longer period of time, maintain your posture when sitting or standing. So they don't get fatigue very easily. So these are red type of fibers. And some of the fibers, which are called white fibers, these fibers are very fast to contract, but the contraction cannot last for a longer period of time because these fibers get fatigued very easily. Example is the extraocular muscles of eyeball. Very swiftly they can contract, eyeball can move very swiftly, but it gets tired very fast. And other types are intermediate where it is between the two. So first is, first we are done is according to the color. And now let us see classification according to the direction of muscle fibers. So this classification is based on the fascicular architecture. Let us first try to understand what is fascicle. What is the fascicle of the skeletal muscle? Here you see in this figure, this is a muscle cell which is now called muscle fiber. Bunch of muscle cell forms a bundle and this bundle is called fascicle. Individual muscle fiber, then many muscle fibers together forms a bundle and this bundle is called fascicle and so many fascicle unites and forms one muscle. So this is called fascicle. So this classification is based on the architecture 
of the bundles of muscle fiber. So let us try to understand them one by one. The first is parallel fasciculus where bundles are running parallel to each other. It can be in quadrilateral, quadrilateral in shape. It can be very long, strap-like, then strap-like with tendinous intersections. And at the end, they converge and form the fusiform fasciculus. First is quadrilateral fasciculus. So here, this is a quadrilateral fasciculus. Example is pronator quadratus or thyroid muscle. Strap-like fasciculus parallel. An example is sartorius, which is the longest muscle in the body. Another is sternohyoid. And fusiform fasciculus. Here, the example is biceps brachii or digastric muscle. So these are parallel fasciculus. Now let us see some parallel fasciculus with tendinous intersection. So this one is a parallel fasciculus with tendons in between. And the example this one is rectus abdominis muscle. Then comes convergent fasciculus where the fascicle converges to one point. So here we have got a triangular muscle. Example is infraspinatus or we have got fan shaped, fan -shaped muscle. Example is temporalis. So these are convergent fasciculus. Then twisted fasciculus or spiral fasciculus where the bundles get twisted upon one another. An example is pectoralis major muscle and latissimus dorsi muscle. Here you can see this lower part of the pectoralis major muscle, the fascicles are getting twisted. Circular fasciculus are sphincteric. Here the muscle fibers run in a circular manner. Example is orbicularis oculi and orbicularis oris. So they have a sphincteric action in the body. This is cruciate fasciculus. Cruciate means cross, crucifixion. The word is derived from cross. So this is a cruciate fasciculus. The example is sternocleidomastoid, where you can see the, the uh, clavicular fibers are getting crossed behind. So this is cruciate fasciculus. Then comes very important fascicula is pinnate fasciculi. Pinnate means feather, a feather of a bird, right? So there is pinnate. So here you can see that what happens in this, that here, you can see this one. So tendon is at one side and the fascicles are coming from one side. Your tendon is in between. The fascicles are coming from both the side. So this is called unipinnate fasciculus. This is bipinnate fasciculus. Here the tendon is in center. The fascicle come from all, all the sides in like a circular manner. So it is called radial or circumpinnate fasciculus. And here there are so many feather like feature and so many tendons in between. It is called multipinnate fasciculus. So this is unipinnate bipinnate, circumpinnate and multipinnate fasciculus. So this brings us to the end of classification based on fascicular architecture. Let us understand the range and power of a muscle contraction. Sometimes when you contract a muscle, we need more range of uh, movement and sometimes we need more power in the movement. So the range depends on the length of the muscle fibers. The longer the fiber, more would be the range of the motion. Examples are parallel and fusiform fasciculus. And sometimes we need more power. So that depends on total number of muscle fibers. More the number, number of muscle fibers, greater will be the power in the movement. Examples is convergent, pinnate, that is unipinnate, bipinnate and multipinnate. Multipinnate muscle fibers have got maximum number of power because in small area, more number of fibers are enclosed. So we have finished with two types of classification. One is based on color and direction of muscle fibers. Now let us go to third type that is based on the force of action. Now, so this classification is based on force of action. Whenever we are doing movement, many muscles are contracting simultaneously at that joint. Some of the muscles are producing active swinging movement and some muscles are contracting just to maintain stability of the joint. So the muscles which are bringing the movement swing component, they are called sport muscles. And some muscles at the same time are just maintaining the stability of the joint, they are called shunt muscles. If you observe, in the spurt muscles, the origin is away from the joint and insertion is closer to the joint. And in the shunt muscle, the origin is closer to the joint and insertion is away from the joint. The example of spurt muscle is brachialis and shunt muscle is brachioradialis. So after three types, now let us go to classification based on group of, group of action. So this is based on action of muscles. First of all, we need to understand that muscles always work in a team. Whenever movement is occurring, it is always a coordinated action of several muscles acting together. So based on the teamwork, the muscles are classified as agonist, antagonist, synergist and fixators. 
first is agonist and antagonist so whenever a prime movement is occurring the muscle producing the prime movement like flexion are called agonist and the muscles producing opposing movement that is extension they are called antagonist but you must remember that whenever an agonist is contracting at the same time antagonist has to relax then only a smooth movement can occur and during opposite movement when antagonist are contracting the agonist has to relax smoothly so this is agonist and antagonist working together then comes fixators whenever a muscle is uh, producing movement at the joint the other muscle surrounding the joint contracts at the same time they are not doing any active movement but what they do is they maintain the stability of the joint so they are called fixators they fixes the joint so that a muscle can produce a smooth movement at the joint so here is when the deltoid is trying to abduct the shoulder joint the other muscle surrounding the shoulder joint contract so that they maintain the stability of glenohumeral joint then comes synergist now synergist are group of muscles uh, we need to understand this so we know that there are muscles in the forearm they are called flexors so this flexors of forearm they cross wrist joint same muscle crossed carpo metacarpal joint metacarpo phalangeal joint interphalangeal joint and some of the flexors insert at the base of distal phalanx this when this flexor muscle contract they produce flexion of wrist they produce flexion of metacarpo phalangeal joint and they also produce flexion of interphalangeal joint is it right okay then we also know that at the back of the forearm the muscles are called extensor muscles similarly like flexors they can produce extension at the wrist joint metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of interphalangeal joint because they cross all this joint and get inserted on the extensor part or the dorsal surface of the distal phalanx so now if the flexors are contracting they are reducing in size whenever we want to produce a movement of flexion of only at interphalangeal joint the muscles should also do flexion of wrist joint also because it's the same muscle but we don't have that undesirable flexion of the wrist when we try to flex the interphalangeal joint so whenever we try to do that what happens is that the extensors they go in contraction and then they try to maintain the stability at the wrist joint and also at the stability at stability at the metacarpophalangeal joint so that we can produce smooth flexion of interphalangeal joint to try to do this try to flex your fingers just fingers put your hand on the extensor muscles and you will observe that when you are trying to flex your finger it should only be the flexors working at that time but you will also observe the extensors are also going contraction at the same time why are, why are they doing that because when you are flexing the fingers interphalangeal joint they are maintaining stability they are maintaining extension at the wrist and metacarpophalangeal joint so this kind of mutual understanding and mutual help of the muscles this is called synergistic action so this brings us to the end of classification of skeletal muscles we have classified them based on color based on fascicular architecture based on force of action and according to the group of action now let us understand how the different skeletal muscles are named in the body so nomenclature of skeletal muscle is based on its location shape size direction number of origin and action let us see them one by one first is let us see how the mu skeletal muscles are named based on location here you see that there is a spine of scapula the muscle above the spine of scapula is called supraspinatus and below the spine is called infraspinatus there is a tibia in the leg and the muscle in front of tibia is called tibialis anterior and the muscle behind the tibia is called tibialis posterior so by the location the muscles are named then muscles are also named by the shape here you see this muscle is called deltoid delta means triangle this muscle is a triangular in shape that's why it is called deltoid here you see this muscle is having a, a serrated appearance a saw tooth appearance that's why it is called serratus muscle a trapezoid shape muscle is called trapezius and a rhombus shape muscle is called rhomboidus so this is based on shape now certain muscles are named based based on size so gluteal region muscles are called gluteus the largest is called maximus and smallest is called minimus the muscle which is long will be called longus and the short muscle will be called brevis 
a large muscle will also be called major and a small muscle will be called minor here you see here is a swaz major muscle which is large and a smaller muscle is called swaz minor some muscles are named by direction of fibers here you see this muscle is called rectus rectus means straight the fibers are going straight like a strip this one is called rectus present in the abdominal region rectus abdominis so fibers are straight strip like so this is rectus abdominis here you see the direction of fibers is transverse so this is called transverse abdominis here the direction is oblique so it is called external oblique muscle so this is based on direction of muscle fibers now some muscles are named based on the number of head of origin the biceps has got two head of origin a short head and a long head of biceps then three head of origin is called triceps and four muscles together is called quadriceps quadriceps muscle in the femoral region so it is called quadriceps femoris some muscles are named based on its origin and insertion so it gives us the idea of the origin of the muscle and insertion of the muscle this is the muscle called sternocleidomastoid because it, because it arises from the sternum the clavicle goes upward and gets inserted in the mastoid process that's why it is called sternocleidomastoid similarly there is stylohyoid and cricothyroid some muscles are named because of their action we know that actions are flexions extensions adduction abduction and so forth so flexion of digit is called flexor digitorum the muscle causes extension of digit extension of digit is called extensor digitorum abductor pollicis is the abductor uh, causes the abduction of the uh, thumb and adductor pollicis is causing adduction of the thumb so the, similarly there is adductor magnus which adducts the thigh so this is how different muscles are named now let us go into microscopic level of the muscle and try to understand the structural organization this is more of a physiology we'll just a brief look at the structural organization of the muscle now we understood one thing that there is this muscle fiber which is a cell of the muscle and so many muscle fibers together will form one fascicle and so many fascicle together will form one muscle now this is the whole muscle and it is formed by so many fascicle the whole of the muscle is surrounded by a connective tissue and that is called epimysium so epimysium is a covering of the whole muscle and if we take one muscle bundle or one muscle fascicle then the one muscle fascicle is composed of many muscle fibers and this fascicle is surrounded by a connective tissue that is called perimysium and if we take individual muscle fibers it is surrounded by endomysium and inside the individual muscle fiber or a cell there are this myofibrils which are the contractile unit of the muscle cell so muscle fiber surrounded by endomysium muscle fascicle surrounded by perimysium and the whole of muscle muscle is surrounded by epimysium and this is a contractile unit of the muscle where there is actin and myosin filament where myosin head binds with the actin and these are two z lines so area between two z line is a sarcomere whenever there is a contraction these two z lines comes closer to each other and this will lead to the contraction of muscle so here this is the contraction of a muscle fiber and it is it is called sliding filament mechanism this is the contraction of the spool muscle where you see the, the contractile units are in criss cross manner and this is how they bring contraction to the smooth muscle so after we understood how the contraction of skeletal and smooth muscle take place let us try to understand different type of contractions the first is isotonic contraction iso means same tonic means tension here the tension remains same or fixed but the length of the muscle changes so this is our day to day activity here you can see that here the weight is fixed for example 20 kg so the weight is fixed so the tension or the tone will remain fixed but what will change during the movement a length of the muscle will change so this is called isotonic contraction the other type is isometric where the length of the muscle remain fixed and the tone changes how does this happen let us understand uh, i know it's very funny but if you try to push the wall standing on a fixed distance from the wall once you put your hand on the wall and at the fixed distance the length of the muscle is now fixed and you try to apply more and more pressure on the wall but the wall is not going to move 
right unless until you are super uh, superman or something so when you try to push the wall you apply more and more power to push the wall but your length is not changing because you are standing at a fixed distance so this kind of contraction is called isometric contraction when you try to pull something which is fixed on the ground which is non movable and you apply more and more power to that to do that movement so that kind of contraction is called isometric where the length remains fixed but the tone keeps on increasing and decreasing depending on your power so now let us understand blood supply of the skeletal muscles now skeletal muscles are richly supplied by blood and the vessel the point of entry of the blood vessel is called neurovascular hyla because it's the same point where the nerve also enters inside the muscles are rich in blood supply a small muscles get one artery and two veins and a large muscles gets several arteries it is said that 1 cm square of muscle has got 8 meters long capillary bed lymphatic drainage the lymphatic vessels are present mostly in the epimysium and perimysium of the muscle fiber and it is absent in endomysium except in the cardiac muscles now let us understand nerve supply of skeletal muscles now the nerve supplying the skeletal muscle is called motor nerve which is mixed nerve which is having 60% motor fibers and 40% sensory fibers and here you see that the motor supply of the nerve the cell body of that nerve is in the anterior horn of the gray matter of spinal cord its long process comes out as a motor root it forms a spinal trunk and then ultimately it forms a nerve and supply the muscle fibers now here this is one muscle getting supplied by two different nerve now one purple nerve is supplying less number of muscle fibers and another red nerve which is supplying more number of muscle fibers so motor unit is defined as the number of muscle fibers supplied by one motor neuron now smaller the motor unit the movement would be more finer and larger the motor unit the movement would be more coarse so purple or motor unit one is a smaller motor unit and the red one is the large motor unit uh, example of large motor unit is the muscles of thighs muscles of trunk and the example of small motor unit is the muscles of uh, eyeball extraocular muscles of eyeball and smaller intrinsic muscles of hand these are having smaller motor units so the action is more fine and more controlled action now there is one term called hybrid muscle when the muscle is supplied by two different motor nerve with different root value then it is called hybrid muscle examples are adductor magnus flexor digitorum profundus and pectoralis major these muscles are supplied by two different nerve with different root values that's why they are called hybrid muscles so in the end we come to applied anatomy of the muscular system first is few words called hypertrophy atrophy and hyperplasia hypertrophy is an increase in the size of muscle and atrophy is the decrease in the size of muscle so skeletal muscle cannot increase in number the only thing they can increase in the size and smooth muscle sometimes they increase in the number number of muscle fibers that is called hyperplasia if you don't use your muscle for some period of time for example fracture of hand when your hand is immobilized or muscles are immobilized they reduce in the size and power and that is called atrophy and if you overuse your muscles then it is called hypertrophy please remember the number does not increase it is only the size of the muscle fiber that increases in hypertrophy muscles are used for intramuscular injections deltoid and gluteal regional muscles in the children in in pediatric patient usually it is the lateral side of thigh preferred for intramuscular injection myositis is inflammation of the muscles and the pain in the muscle is called myalgia paralysis is a complete loss of muscle function and that could be central or peripheral paralysis uh, if the defect is in the central nervous system then it is called central paralysis and defect in the peripheral nerves it is called peripheral paralysis convulsions are the abnormal uncoordinated contraction of various group of muscles at the same time rigor mortis is the post mortem changes in the muscle where the muscles become stiff and ultimately because of the breakdown of protein after 40 to 60 hours there is the relaxation so this phenomenon is called rigor mortis poliomyelitis is the because of viral infection of the nerves that controls the skeletal muscle and now because of oral polio vaccine program it is almost eradicated 
Now, myocardium can be affected because of lack of blood supply. Angina pectoris is a transient condition where the pain can be relieved by taking rest. And if it is prolonged and the myocardium is not being able to revive back, then it is called myocardial infarction. In layman term, we call it heart attack. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease in which the immune cells attack the receptors which are there to bind with acetylcholine. So acetylcholine does not effectively bind with the receptors and there is weakness in the muscle contraction. That is called myasthenia gravis. Amitabh Bachchan suffers from myasthenia gravis. It said that it takes 17 muscles to smile and 43 muscles to cry. So it is better to utilize 17 muscles and keep smiling. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching the video. Please subscribe, hit the button if you like the video and please, please comment on today's lecture. I'll be very happy to receive your comments. Thank you so much.